Welcome everyone to this um, episode of Earthwatch's webinar series. We're really excited to have you here on our fifth webinar. So we're really getting up there with cool research results to share with everyone. We're gonna get started. Um, today, you're gonna hear from Dr. Carrie Grimm about the research she's conducting in Costa Rica. She's one of the PIs, that's principal investigator, not private investigator, um, for the Earthwatch expedition, monkeys, parrots, and other wildlife in the forests of Costa Rica. She collaborates with Dr. Claire Aslan and Dr. Sarah Frey and several other folks who you're gonna get to hear from throughout the expedition, a lot of wonderful people to hear from today. Um, and this is part of what she does as a researcher, as a researcher at Northern Arizona State University. Um, if you missed our past webinars, don't worry, you're in luck. We recorded them and they're up on Earthwatch's YouTube channel. So if after this one you're super excited, you can pop back there and listen to those and watch them as well. Um, in, a, in a minute, Carrie's gonna take control of the presentation and start sharing with you, but I wanna give you a quick walkthrough of the buttons you might be seeing on your screen. Um, so you're, we're gonna start off with about 45 minutes of her giving an overview of the research and what the results are. And throughout that time, think about any questions you might have for her. You can jot them down on a piece of paper where you are, or you'll see there's um, a chat function um, on your screen. If you move your mouse around, different buttons should come up and one says chat. You can type your questions in there at any point during the presentation. We'll keep track of them and then we'll moderate some Q&A. We'll try really hard to get to everyone's questions. Um, we want you to get to learn and hear as much as possible, but that's what that's for. Um, that's really the main feature that's there. Um, so enter those as you think of them. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Carrie. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. Let me get my screen back. There we go. All Perfect. right, well, thank you everyone. Um, and it's actually not just me that's here today. Um, it's me and Dr. Claire Aslan are going to present. And um, Dr. Sarah Frey is also hopefully um, there. She is actually in Costa Rica at the moment. So her internet um, might be a little spotty. So we're going to do most of the presentation and hopefully she'll be able to chime in um, to answer questions uh, if that works out. And then I also have some of the other researchers with me that you'll get to hear a little bit more um, as we go. So our project um, that we just started and have had one um, trip so far is monkeys, parrots, and other wildlife in the forests of Costa Rica. And um, Claire and I are at Northern Arizona University and Sarah most recently uh, was at Oregon State University um, doing a postdoc down there. Um, so let's tell you a little bit about this project um, and we'll also be able to share a little bit from our first trip that we've had so far. So first we'll do introductions and you can meet the scientists and then we'll talk about the scientific rationale for the study, why we wanted to look at it, um, what questions we have, and then give a little overview of what we're doing down there, what the day-to-day -day looks like. Um, and then because a lot of Earthwatch um, trips have this rest or rec recreation day, we're gonna talk about some of the opportunities that um, people can, you know, trips they can go on to explore the area um, beyond where our research sites are. So a little bit about me, um, I'm originally from New York and then have traveled, did a master's in University of Nevada, Reno, did my PhD at Oregon State in environmental studies, um, and then landed here in 2014 at Northern Arizona University as a lecturer in environmental science studies. Um, and my research um, really looks at the human environment interaction. So I do a lot of social science research where I, I talk to people about their views about the environment. Um, and here's just a few pictures of me so you could get to know who I am. There's me and my family, um, my four-year-old son and my husband and our baby that was born this summer. Um, the top picture is um, me teaching a field class out looking at um, conducting ecological research in a fire 
of scar. And then just enjoying the outdoors as much as I can. So I'm gonna turn it over and we'll all take turns introducing ourselves. Hello everyone, my name is Claire Aslan and I'm one of the additional scientists on this project. So this is my introducing myself slide. Um, my background in Latin America started when you see the picture on the upper right when I was in the Peace Corps for three years in Honduras. So I've lived for a long time in an area that has some similarities to the region that we'll be working in in Costa Rica. It's a little different in other ways, uh, but at least it, it gave me that real love for Latin America and for travel in that part of the world. I currently live here in Flagstaff. The bottom right <coughs> slide is showing the Grand Canyon, which is one of the, the greatest um, perks of living here in Flagstaff. I do a lot of work on both rims of the Grand Canyon in various ecological questions. The two pictures on the bottom left are sort of illustrating that most of my ecological research has been in either seed dispersal. So on the bottom left, you can see me capturing a bird. We were taking measurements on that particular bird and then we waited until it defecated and collected seeds out of its <laughs> poop. Um, and so that was during my PhD dissertation a number of years ago. And then the picture of my hand uh, sort of cupping a flower there is from my pollination work, which is another major part of my research. And that particular plant is in Hawaii. I've been doing research in Hawaii for about 20 years. And then the upper left is me and my family. We're backpacking on the North Rim of the Grand Canyon. So my husband there and my two kids, ages 12 and eight. And I'll pass on. Hi, I'm Sarah Fry, and I'm um, a postdoctoral scholar at Oregon State University. So my home base is Corvallis, Oregon, but right now I'm actually at Las Cruces in Costa Rica. Um, didn't have any, or didn't put any photos of, of that on here, but just a little um, background about me. I did my PhD at Oregon State as well. And the picture with the sunrise is uh, the field site where I do my work in Oregon. And my work there focuses on bird distributions and how they're influenced by um, vegetation structure and microclimate and how that has implications for future climate change. And then I've also been working here in Costa Rica since 2010 on a project um, looking at hummingbird pollination and how it's influenced by forest fragmentation. And that's how I got involved um, with this project. Um, both Carrie and I were at OSU overlapping a little bit and then um, it just yeah, seemed like a, a, a good fit. And um, that's a picture of me and my daughter Adeline at the field site in Oregon. Um, I also do some meadow work there looking at um, the influence of meadow um, fragmentation on hummingbirds and there's a lot of uh, forest encroachment on the meadows there and that's expected to continue. Um, I guess I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Hi there, my name is Martha and I'm a research associate here at Northern Arizona University and also a field team leader on this project in Costa Rica. I had the pleasure of being one of the leaders on our first trip last month, which was really, really awesome. And um, I just finished my master's degree here. I worked with Dr. Aslan on my master's project, which was doing some vegetation um, regeneration research in Patagonia, Argentina. So I had some prior experience doing research in um, South America and was really excited to get involved with another project in Latin America. And I am excited about heading down uh, at least one other time here in the coming months. Hi everyone, my name's Robin. I'm a graduate student here at Northern Arizona University on this project. Uh, it's my first year here in Flagstaff. I did my undergraduate at the University of Vermont and did my thesis working with volunteer ecotourists in Ecuador. Since then, I've spent a significant amount of time doing ecological studies in Latin America and the Caribbean and have worked at birding centers there. It's been really great to be here working on the project and I'll be leading trips in March and through the whole summer. So 
So looking forward to hopefully meeting some of you. And then one um, other scientist, another grad student on this project is John Leary. And he um, is in class at the moment, so he wasn't able to join us. Um, but he is going to be work also leading trips um, at the same time Robin is. And he's involved in, as you'll hear, there's two parts of this project. He's involved with a lot of the social science research. Um, they'll be interviewing landowners in addition to helping collect ecological data. And he's really interested in issues around conservation, wilderness, um, and he also enjoys getting out, as you can see, um, and enjoying various landscapes. Um, and he has a background in um, doing restoration work, um, both riparian areas and forest, and also um, he has taught English as a second language, um, and some of his teaching has been in Spain. So um, both of our grad students are fluent in Spanish. Um, and the reason he joined this project is he really wanted to understand how the human and natural systems function together. Um, and he wanted an international perspective on land management to get a deeper understanding of private landowner perspectives on conservation. Um, it's not just focusing on parks, for example. And he wanted to work with volunteers collecting um, important ecological data. And he has a lot of experience leading crews and working with volunteers. So he wanted to continue doing that. And he also wanted us to mention that Costa Rica always has a special place in his heart because that's the first country he ever visited. So he's excited to get back and um, do a little bit of work down there as well. Okay. okay, so we wanted to start by giving you just a little overview and introduction to the region that you're going to be working in and also the field station where this project takes place. So this picture here is illustrating Coto Bruce, which is the canton of Costa Rica where Las Cruces Field Station is located. This is in the southern portion of the country. It's fairly high elevation for the most part, very mountainous, uh, very steep road getting up to the field station. That was something that we've all noticed <laughs> for sure. Um, lots of, as you can see, quite a, a, a rich vegetation in that area, very green and very lush. And it's also an agricultural area that's very important for a lot of people. There um, are communities there that are centered around uh, growing a number of agricultural crops, including some coffee, including corn, beans, um, some smaller crops such as tomatoes and peppers. It's sort of a, a rural area um, that was actually settled pretty extensively by uh, immigrants from Italy for a long time. So you have a real mixed culture with a lot of heritage from a number of different places. There's a huge diversity of birds in this area. It's fairly high elevation, and so you don't get the, the real coastal birds um, of Costa Rica, but you get some beautiful cloud forest and, and high elevation birds. Um, and there are also white-faced monkeys in the area. Las Cruces Field Station is where we will be housed during this project, and it's where a fair amount of the data collection takes place, about half of it. So Las Cruces is one of the Organization for Tropical Studies field stations in Costa Rica. OTS is a, a, an organization that is out of the United States. They have three field stations in Costa Rica that are dedicated to research. Um, they, they permit long-term research because they've been in place for many decades. And they provide a lot of the essential services that you need in order to effectively conduct research, like good internet, for example, <laughs> um, or a laboratory <laughs> facility, places where you can store your samples safely, etc. So Las Cruces is located high up in the mountains in Cocho Bruce. You're about 4,000 feet elevation or so. And it is built on the site of a world famous botanical garden called Wilson Botanical Garden. That garden was put into place by Dr. Wilson um, early in the 20th century. And it has this amazing collection of plants from all over the world organized by large plant groups. Many of them labeled beautiful sort of carefully cultivated walkways and paths. So it's really a destination and an attraction in and of itself for tourists, for people who are interested in natural history, for people who are interested in horticulture. Um, you can see on the bottom right, that's an image of the lodging facilities. There's a number of different types of cabins and other types of lodging that are available at Las Cruces, but that, that's an example. 
Um, and then behind you can see how the land kind of slopes away and heads down toward the local town of San Vito. On the left there, you can see some signs that are just sort of typical all over the place. It's a very uh, easy to, to navigate field station with signs everywhere telling you where everything is. You can see that sign indicates reception, the dining hall, the library where there's lots of resources, um, access to the different cabins. So it's just a really comfortable, beautiful place to take a retreat for a while. All right, and I want to apologize. I am, I think at the start of a cold, so I, I'm trying not to cough as much as I can, but I just want to apologize in advance. Um, so why are we here? Why do we choose to do this study? Um, so one of the things is, as Claire mentioned, that there's a lot of biodiversity, a lot of vegetation, but also a lot of agriculture in this area. And this is not a unique phenomenon in a lot of places around the world. There's human modified landscapes everywhere um, where people are working with the natural resources living on the land. And so when we think about conservation, it's the new reality that we have to think about, you know, species are occupying both maybe the natural habitat that was there before humans, but also, um, you know, working with occupying affected by the human landscape that um, has been created. And in some ways, um, we look at how human activities impact it, um, how they can maybe support it, and how also we can meet human needs. And so, not to read this whole thing, but to give you an idea, and this is up here for you to read if you'd like, uh, we really want to, and what the study's looking at, is to understand land management practices that are tolerable, maybe even help wildlife. Um, and in this area, like we said, there's a lot of agricultural locations um, that per contain trees that have fruits, and a lot of wildlife in the area rely on these fruits. Um, and in some cases, the farmers planted these trees. In other cases, the trees might have volunteered um, and farmers just allowed them to grow and not cut them down. Um, and so we really want to learn, you know, these trees, which animals are using them, how are they helping them, how do they help maybe the habitat, um, and be important resources for birds and other wildlife in Costa Rica. And we also want to understand how people can help wildlife, but also then in turn be helped by the environment as well. So we want to understand practices that work for both people and the wildlife. And then ideally come up with ways that these could be replicated elsewhere. Um, I forgot to mention, but I've done a lot of research in South America as well in Ecuador. Um, actually, my research did look at volunteers as well. And so I met Robin back then when she interviewed me um, about my research. And, but one of the things is, the landowners there said conservation can't just be you put land aside these are working landscapes and we need to find ways that conservation can be economically viable socially viable and that's one of the things that this project gets at is how can we look at conservation in these lived environments where there's private landowners who maybe are also trying to do conservation and live off the land and so one of the things um, is that Functional ecosystems can provide ecosystem services. And ecosystem services are any sort of service that the ecosystem provides, um, something that benefits humans. Uh, and there's a wide variety, things that we take for granted. Um, and so there could be provisioning services. For example, the ecosystem gives us wood, it gives us fiber, it can give us food, um, whether it's fish or crops. We rely on the ecosystem for that. And there can also be regulating services, um, which would be uh, things like water filtration or pollination. Um, there's been studies that have been done that um, without pollination, uh, animal pollination, such as bees um, and hummingbirds, there's a lot of crops that wouldn't exist. And they're finding, for example, in some places in Japan, they're having to do hand pollination now to provide the service um, that the ecosystem once provided for free. And then there's also cultural services, um, such as recreation, um, going out and enjoying um, the environment. And as you see through these pictures, a lot of these volunteers definitely seem to and have told us they enjoyed the environment, enjoyed looking at the environment. And that's something that the ecosystem also provides. So we want to look at, in terms of ecosystem services, how might fruiting trees benefit the farmers in Cota Bruce? 
One of the important just concepts for this study is the concept of habitat fragmentation. And in case you're not familiar with that, it's the idea that when you have continuous habitat, um, it becomes fragmented into these smaller isolated patches. And habitat fragmentation can occur from a wide variety of things, from roads to development. And in this case, it's very much um, farms, agricultural landscapes that have interspersed within these natural remnant forests. So habitat fragmentation um, is a reality of a lot of agricultural land. And one of the things we, um, as we'll talk about, we're looking at is how maybe some of these trees that are planted in agricultural land provide a way for species to travel. Okay, so one of the key scientific principles that this particular study is built on is the concept of mutualisms. So that's the first scientific word I'll give you, but it might actually be the last. We're going to keep things pretty, pretty non-technical here. But this word mutualism, um, the meaning of it is really contained in the word itself. It means that there's some sort of an interaction between two species that is mutually beneficial for both of them. And in this case, the interaction is known as seed dispersal. So seed dispersal occurs when an animal takes a seed from a plant and moves it somewhere that that seed wouldn't be able to get on its own. And there's a few specific benefits that mutualism provides on both sides. The primary one is that seed dispersal promotes forest regeneration. So it's a little bit like um, a kid who's grown a little bit too old and is still living in their parents' basement. And as a result, they're kind of taking food and resources from the parents who probably shouldn't have to share at this point. <laughs> the same thing happens with a young plant that happens to fall directly beneath its parent tree and grow right there. They will actually compete directly for resources. So the plant, the, the baby plant and the parent plant need the same nutrients, they need the same water, they may need some other uh, important resources together, and both of them actually don't do as well in that particular uh, situation. So seed dispersal is known to make the plants more successful by just simply moving that seed and therefore that baby plant away from the parent. So that's one way in which forest regeneration is improved when seeds can get out there and get across the landscape instead of simply growing directly beneath the parent tree. Additionally, seed dispersal promotes gene flow among individual plants. Um, and so on the bottom right hand side here, you can see this sort of mixed image of a habitat where you've got various chunks of forest shown as dark green. And then in between them, they're connected by these kind of lighter green patches, which are areas where, okay, you got some plants, but things are a little bit disrupted, a little bit fragmented. You've lost some of that continuous forest cover. Well, if plants are able to move between these big chunks, then they can exchange their genes among those chunks. And a lot of times they can't do that without a seed disperser moving them. If that doesn't happen, then you can get isolated populations that can become very inbred with some problems. Additionally, and this is kind of obvious, but seed dispersal provides food for animals. Mostly the animals are consuming a fruit, and that fruit itself often has a nice, you know, tasty flesh that's surrounding the seed or some other benefit that it's offering. The seeds themselves then usually either pass directly through the animal or perhaps are regurgitated. They come, they, they're kind of thrown up <laughs> by the animal. Um, and the seed itself then remains intact, but the rest of the fruit provided food for the animal. So seed dispersal as a mutualism is able to really extend appropriate habitat for, for plants into modified landscapes by enabling gene flow, by enabling forest regeneration across, say, a fallow field, for example. And it also extends wildlife habitat into modified habitats by providing food for animals who are existing in an area that's now got a certain amount of farming and other kinds of disturbance. So the questions that we have are really centered around the fact that we're dealing with an, a modified landscape here. If seed dispersal is active in an agricultural landscape, then it may be that those areas are really important components of conservation planning because wildlife are still able to use that habitat because it extends the total range in which a particular animal may be successful. And the same goes for the plants themselves that are able to grow in these landscapes. Now, that then leads to some questions, and this is what we're trying to address with our research. First of all, if seed dispersal is active in such landscapes, then what features of those landscapes are important? 
So is it the case that the entire agricultural area, the entire kind of mixed use <coughs> rural area is important habitat for all of the wildlife species and all of the plant species? Or instead, are there certain sort of configurations of land use that work really well for the species that we're concerned with? And if seed dispersal is active in such landscapes, which species are those that participate and benefit? So which species can use a farm just as easily as they can use the forest? And which species really can't? And of course, we're gonna find through the course of this study that every species is somewhat different. So the, the group of species using these landscapes is likely to be a little different than the group of species that you'd expect in the broader forest. So I mentioned before, there's um, the John is going to be talking to local landowners and one of the things about this research that's somewhat unique is that we're not just looking um, at ecological data looking at seed dispersers um, and the role they play and how they're able to um, live if they are in a fragmented ecosystem but we're also going to be talking to local landowners and so one part of this project that volunteers won't be um, involved with really, um, but it is a big part of the larger picture, is to understand you know, what benefits do trees offer people? What do people think um, these trees benefit? Why are they planting them? Um, why are they leaving them? And so really understand those motivations, but also barriers. If there's sort of challenges, if there's some people who aren't planting or leaving trees, why are they doing that, um, making those decisions? And if we find that this is ecologically benefit, a goal is to then find ways to encourage people and um, find ways to maybe help remove some of these barriers, whether it's um, proposing certain policies. And then also looking at the ecological knowledge that landowners have. Um, you know, are they planting them more for just as they see this benefits me, or do they also have some sort of ecological knowledge of how these trees could be benefiting the ecosystem as well? And we're going to tie that in with the seed dispersal ecological research that Claire's been talking about, um, you know, looking at the benefits to trees um, that they offer to wildlife and the role that planted or left trees play in reducing that fragmentation. Um, and then ideally, we, we also plan to have some research that pulls both of these together, looking at people's knowledge um, and what's actually playing out on the ground. Since volunteers are going to be focused on that ecological data collection, I'm going to turn it over to Claire to talk more in detail about what the volunteers are doing on this project. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is try to kind of give you a picture of what a typical team does with its time while you're there. First of all, and really primary, is straight up observations. We're trying to understand what wildlife are using fruiting trees on the farms around Las Cruces. And we're also trying to understand what wildlife are using fruiting trees on the Las Cruces grounds themselves. Las Cruces has the largest intact forest in the immediate area, and it has a really remarkable diversity of birds and other wildlife. So it's really serving as a bit of a sanctuary for many species. So we're interested in comparing which wildlife are able to use that large, intact, conserved forest versus those that are able to use these multi-use agricultural areas that are so important to humans. So what you see here in these pictures are volunteers watching and watching and watching. You can see in the bottom right hand <coughs> picture that sometimes it's a little tiring to watch so many trees with so much fruit. But the idea is to really record who's coming, who's visiting, what are they doing when they're there. And we have a, a protocol for that. We have careful data sheets that people fill out where they're noting the abundance of fruit in the area and then the visitation rates by all these different visiting groups. You can also see on the bottom left, there's a volunteer using one of the guides that we've produced. It's this large laminated sheet of paper showing pictures of the most common fruit eating birds in the area. We don't expect any of the volunteers who come down to be bird experts at all. We don't expect you to know the Costa Rican birds. Um, instead, what we do is we work with you to identify the broad groups of birds that you're looking at, the types of birds you're looking at, um, and to make your best educated guess um, any, anywhere beyond that. And then we analyze the data at those sort of larger group levels. This is definitely a citizen science research project. And our interest is in what's the diversity of groups of wildlife that are using these. We don't have to worry too much about uh, being complete bird experts for this region. 
You can see the picture of the volunteer entering <coughs> data on the computer. That's one of the additional activities that's very important is after every observation session, we do get those data entered. They get entered into a Google Drive sheet that is then viewable by all the scientists on this project everywhere. And so what we try to do is actually keep up with the data and continue to analyze it sort of in real time as a group is, is gathering those data and uploading them so that we understand what we're able to see over the course of the year. So the next activity, kind of the secondary activity, is we're trying to get a sense of what's the seed condition after an animal has, has messed around with that fruit in any particular way. Um, it's, it's, although a particular bird or a particular mammal or reptile has consumed a fruit, it doesn't necessarily make that a seed dispersal event unless that fruit emerges in a healthy uh, condition and is able to then grow into a baby plant. And so we're trying to check on that and we're trying to get a sense of how much seed dispersal as a whole is really operating across the area. On the bottom left, you see volunteers making seed traps. And then the center photo in the bottom um, is the volunteers hanging the seed traps. In fact, that's Sarah there that's uh, working with Mao, who's our local research assistant. Um, and they're hanging up a seed trap in one of our research sites to get a sense of how often the seeds that fall into it over the course of time are seeds that did not come from the plant directly above that trap, but instead must have been moved there by some sort of an animal. So we make the traps, that's definitely something every group will be helping out with, and then distribute them around the landscape. And when we collect seeds, either because they uh, came from a trap or sometimes because we picked them up out of a little pile of bird droppings, then we clean them and look at their condition and we plant them. And in the bottom right, you can see a little greenhouse flat where we're planting some of those initial seeds to see how many of them are able to survive and grow. So the third set of activities that we do is we're also trying to maintain the strong relationship that we have with Las Cruces Ecological Station. And so we're conducting several additional studies and, and tasks for them as we have time. And I say that because there's times that we have a break from the field, but we're able to contribute to these ongoing projects. There's other times that a rainstorm will come in or something like that and we're not able to go out to the field. And then we're able to use our time and energy to help the research station and the local research ecologists. So a few of the key activities that we've been helping with, um, we have some records on the station grounds itself of pollination where we've observed an animal pollinating a plant. So you can see the pictures on the far right there of a bird visiting a plant and a bee visiting a plant. We also conduct observations of herbivory or animals that are eating the plants at the, at the field station and at the botanical garden. So those caterpillars there in the bottom are, are examples of that. Phenology is the study of the, the timing of life events for a particular organism. And so we do have observations we conduct just looking at how many leaves particular plants have and what condition those leaves are in, just to help the garden itself to better understand what's happening on grounds there. And look at those garden labels. Some of them need occasional maintenance and cleaning. And what we've been asked to do by the station is, hey, if you're out there watching pollinators, watching herbivores, and you wanna know what plant you're looking at and you look down and that label could use some cleaning, go ahead and clean it off so that we have a better sense of what we're looking at. So we're trying to keep this really important scientific resource uh, alive and well into the future down there in, in uh, Las Cruces. I'm gonna walk through a few of the initial findings we had from our first team. We have only fielded one team for this project back in January. And so these results are really, really preliminary, but it's kind of interesting anyway. Um, and so what you see is we've got a little mini picture there showing you the general type of fruit that we were observing. And then we have the, the most common, or at least those visitors that we were able to identify to group that we're visiting and interacting with those particular plants. There's a whole process for how we get the, the values that you see there, but essentially the most a uh, common visitor that most reliably visited that particular type of plant has an importance value that we set equal to one. And so that's what the, the graphs are showing you. Whatever is up there at one was the most important visitor for that type of plant. And we don't know if the same visitor is gonna continue to be most important going forward or if that was something specific <coughs> to January. It may be that we have very, very, very different types of visitors in August, for example. So you see for black and purple berries, 
we had a speckled tanager is the most common, most reliable visitor for that particular uh, fruit type. For our green or yellow poems, we had squirrels and toucans that came in and visited that particular type of fruit. For green berries, the most common was the crimson fronted parakeet. And those parakeets will come in in large groups and just strip a tree very, very quickly. For figs, we had silver-throated tanagers that came in very reliably. For palms, the buff-throated saltator was the most common visitor. And for cecropia, which was probably our most reliable fruiter in January, the one that was available across all of our sites, we had a diversity of different species that visited, particularly the blue-gray tanager. So you can see most of these are birds. We did have some squirrels. At the moment, we don't actually have data showing primate visitation in any of our sites. Um, although we did see primates, we saw white-faced capuchin monkeys in a number of places, uh, but not while we were actually conducting observations. And so that's one good illustration of why it's really important to, to put in many, many hours of observations over the course of a year in many places to try to capture some of that diversity. So once the, the work has been done, there's always a good opportunity about midway through each team for recreation. And I'm going to pass it on to Carrie to describe a few of the opportunities there. Okay. And so um, the first thing is, you know, you don't have to go and travel. You might be, oh, all this waking up, looking at trees. I want to relax around site. And there's a lot of things you could do at Las Cruces on that day. You could explore those world famous Wilson Botanical Gardens. And there's also some nature trails you could go on. They also have some tours at the bird station. Um, and if you're curious about those, Martha could always fill you in more later because she went on one of them. Um, but there's a bird tour and a station tour that they have available. Um, you can watch local visitors, um, such as the birds that come that maybe aren't eat in the trees, but you can see there's a lot of bright colored birds that come and um, hang out right nearby the station. Or a Gaudis, um, for example, um, are frequent visitors roaming around uh, Las Cruces. Or you could just relax in a hammock or on a table um, <laughs> with a good book. So that's one of the volunteers kicking back and relaxing. We do, though, have some other opportunities. Um, some of them would be half-day trips, um, and some are full-day trips. And they would be determined um, in part by what a variety of people want to do, the majority or enough people because of transportation um, and the cost to have that extra transportation to get somewhere. But some half-day trips is um, this group went to a nearby coffee farm and got to see the grounds, got to taste some coffee. There's also a nature preserve um, nearby. And then there's a really wonderful local tour company that um, provides full day trips. And here's just a sampling of the ones. Um, the prices vary, but they're all pretty, um, not too bad um, in terms of both the transportation and um, the tours. And a lot of them include food and whatnot. So a coffee tour that's farther away, some caves, horseback riding going up to the National Park, going to an indigenous village, going down to the coast on a whale tour, going on a canopy tour. Um, so these are just a variety of them. And if you're interested in knowing more of these as well, more detailed descriptions, um, you could always go to that website and all those tours are listed there. So hopefully um, this has piqued your interest and we invite you to come join us on future trips, whether this year, next year, the following year. Um, and with that, we'd like to take any questions. All right. Thanks so much, ladies. We've got a few different questions coming in, so I'll read them off to you um, so that you can hear them. Do we still um, hear you, Dana? Right. And anyone else who's on the phone, feel free um, in the chat box or the Q&A box. We're keeping an eye on both of them um, to go ahead and um, type your questions in. So one of the questions was, are there any nocturnal wildlife like tapers that feed on the fallen fruits? So yeah, there are definitely nocturnal wildlife. Um, we when we were putting together this project and making some plans for it logistically, we came to the conclusion or realization that at least at this time, it's just not logistically feasible to have volunteers and citizen scientists out doing nocturnal observations. 
partially because transportation uh, becomes more, more dangerous when you're driving around on roads at night. Um, there's also a few other concerns and dangers such as falling, slipping and falling on, you know, wet or muddy land, that kind of thing. And so we made a decision to not do nocturnal observations at this time. Um, however, there, we really are interested in perhaps eventually expanding this to include those nocturnal observations. Normally, you would expect that a number of mammals are pretty big seed dispersers at night, and tapirs are a great example. You also could get kinkajous and a few others. Um, the other thing is on site at Las Cruces, they have some wildlife cameras set up, and they're able to record wildlife that are uh, triggering those cameras through motion detection. So they have a really good sense of what kinds of animals are right there on the field station <laughs> where the cameras can be placed and they'll be safe and they can be monitored. And uh, there were some fun ones while we were there, in fact. While we were there at like three in the morning one day, the camera caught an ocelot walking through the camp and a few other pretty, pretty cool things like that. So yeah, there's definitely a nocturnal component that we'd like to explore in the future. Very cool. Lots of places to go. You know, it's the beginning of your project, so you've got your first things you figure out, and then the future years, I'm sure you'll have time to add new components to it. It's always good to have an idea of what you might want to do in the future. Um, another question we have is about the interaction between the wildlife that's there and their eating of fruit and the, the fruits that the farmers might be farming. So the question is around are these farmers planting in monocultures? Or are they sort of interspersing different types of plants um, among one another? And how are the wildlife that you're seeing sort of impacting the farmer's livelihood? If they're eating things that they're trying to grow to sell or eating the stuff around that? That's a great question. Yeah, so this particular study, we are actually <coughs> deliberately focusing on fruiting species that were planted not for crops. They're not there as part of the farmer's wildlife. They were planted for other reasons. And so sometimes we don't know what those reasons are. So you might have a plant that produces fruit, like a small purple berry, that's great for wildlife, but that's inedible for humans. So we're wondering why the farmer put that tree there. Other times those trees are sort of volunteers. So a seed dispersor brought the, the plant in and dropped it. But then we're wondering why the farmer goes ahead and allows that particular tree to grow. So part of our interview process is to understand what the values of these trees may be for the farmer beyond the fruits. But we're actually deliberately not looking at the interaction with fruits that are crops. Um, there are some trees that humans might use somewhat. So there's like a very tart lemon, for example, that's in lots of the, the farms. And they're just planted kind of randomly here and there. And humans will use them a little bit. They make um, sort of a decent uh, uh, addition. You might squeeze a little lemon juice into a recipe or something, but, they're, but they are not used to their full extent and the animals will come and use them quite a lot. So definitely we're looking at a, a plant that doesn't have that very obvious monetary benefit to people, but we are trying to understand what different benefits it may have. Yeah, and it might be that, as Claire is saying, if it is something, even if they did happen to plant it, if we find out for the fruit thing, it'd be, um, it'd be more for their own personal benefit, not for um, resale or um, anything that a monoculture would produce. It's just maybe you wanted to have this lemon tree so you could use some for personal use. Um, I'll also just chime in. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, I will also add that most of the non-forest area here is actually pasture. So it's not necessarily always competing with crops and that the trees that are either planted or left to grow provide shade for cows as well and they often grow along the the fences and they use live fences so that it benefits the landowners and that it's providing um, shade for their cattle and then in turn benefits other wildlife because they have fruit on them. Great, lots of great additions on that question, simulating a lot of conversation. I like it. Um, kind of building off that, one of the questions we got was about how much the Earthwatch participants get to interact with the community um, because you're interviewing folks and 
do you need to speak Spanish? So how does, how does that work as far as Earthwatch folks and uh, interviews and community interaction? So I'll answer the first part in terms of the interviews themselves, and then I'll let um, Claire or Sarah or Martha to fill in about interactions, since they had some interactions with local community members. Um, in terms of the interviews, unfortunately, we can't have um, Earthwatch volunteers be involved in that due to um, university, all universities have something called the Institutional Review Board, that anytime you're doing any research on human subjects, you have to go through this rigorous process, get it approved. And one of the components is you have to have them approve every single person who's going to be working on the project. So because of the, the nature of the volunteers um, changing and um, it's not something that they would approve, um, unfortunately. So they can't be involved in the interviews, but what we hope to have as we continue with this, and Sarah's had um, this with some of the hummingbird projects, our community meetings or groups where um, community members come who maybe are involved in the project or who have been interviewed, um, and that would be open to volunteers um, to find out more about um, you know, the, the views that people have. Um, but with that being said, these sites are on people's farms, their fincas, and they've allowed us to be on there. So therefore, you very well can interact with the people, the landowners. And so um, I'll turn it over to people who actually have interviewed or interacted with them. <laughs> yeah, just um, briefly, sometimes the farmers are around. They've, they've all given permission for this study to occur on their land. <laughs> and sometimes they're there um, and you can chat with them and, and explain you know, what we're seeing and continue to reiterate what the sort of point of the whole study is, which has been kind of fun. Martha, do you want to explain your fun interaction? With he was trying to give you pointers about where to go, what to look at. Yes, and one of our uh, sites that we can walk to from Las Cruces um, and everybody who goes on this expedition <coughs> undoubtedly would get a chance to visit this finca. It's really neat and that is a place where we have seen the white-faced capuchin monkeys a number of times. Um, there's a really friendly farmer there who was teasing me about uh, my monkeys running around in his cornfield and if I could get my monkeys to go somewhere else and I was asking him if he'd seen the monkeys that day. So um, we have had a couple good friendly interactions with people who are around at the sites and I would also add that um, there's always the, the team leader with the group always speaks Spanish and so it's not a problem if <clears throat> volunteers don't speak Spanish, although in our first group we had some volunteers who had some experience with Spanish and were really excited about practicing and, and did have a chance to interact with some landowners if they, if they chose to, which was also cool for them. And Mal, who is um, a local researcher who's um, working on this project and is quite invaluable, he's the one that got us a lot of that permission, um, he's from the area and he speaks Spanish. So um, you always have the chance if you want to speak Spanish and learn more about the area. Um, and if you don't speak Spanish, you could um, you know, ask questions through one of the trip leaders and they could ask and uh, you can find out more information about that area. So you inevitably would be working with um, someone who is local in that regard. Um, I can just add in, this is Sarah. Um, I would say I've, I've visited many, many, many fincas over the years and um, pretty much all of the landowners are very friendly and really excited to have us doing work on their property. And they're also interested to know what we find and what um, birds or animals are on their property and so overall it's been a really positive experience working with landowners in the area and I do see one question about compensation it might be a good time to answer it, that since we're talking about landowners um, generally they're not compensated um, oh, <laughs> um, compensated with money or anything because there's there's a lot of um, researchers here in the area and so lots of different groups are using different fincas and it would create a um, I don't know what the right word is but it would just um, be a little bit um, difficult I think because if one group paid more or, or the other paid more it would just get complicated so most of it is just done by going and talking to the landowners and you know talking about what we're doing and then maintaining a good relationship with them and then we can do things like invite them to the station 
um, and tell them about our research and, and stuff like that. And, and they really enjoy those kinds of interactions. Awesome. Thanks for tying in a couple of questions at once. Um, we have another, on a different track, another question about wildlife. Um, some folks are wondering if there's fruit bats in the area that they might see. Some other folks were wondering similarly about how much you get to see monkeys. So could you tell us a little bit about um, what wildlife people are most likely to see while they're out there, particularly if they have some interest in fruit bats and monkeys? Um, you know, I might pass most of this question on to Sarah because she has done so much more work down there than the rest of us. I will say that because we're not out at night, we weren't um, doing observations with bats, but there were bats certainly flying around um, in the evening. We even saw them just in the late afternoon when we were under a bit of a forest canopy. Uh, but Sarah probably knows more about which types there are. And then in terms of the monkeys, you know, you, you certainly can't uh, predict ahead of time where they're going to end up being. Um, we were finding them very regularly at the particular finca that, that Martha mentioned. And they were sort of moving around. They were generally eating fruit. They're pretty quiet in the trees. And in, in a few cases, I think it was almost accidental that we spotted them. Um, we just happened to, like the right person glanced up at the right time and went, there's something in the tree above me and then realized there were a dozen monkeys in the tree above them. Um, and so that was really cool and got some nice time with the monkeys. When I went in August, we didn't see any monkeys. And so it just seems to be really dependent on the season. The monkeys are gonna move around in search of their resources. Uh, so it's a little bit hard to say, but I'm gonna see if Sarah has stuff to add given her um, long depth of experience in that area. <coughs> Um, well, I am definitely not a bat expert, but um, I do know that there's quite a diversity of bats in this area and there are fruit eating bats. Um, there have been some researchers from Stanford that have actually studied bats and done telemetry with bats and um, Mao, our local field assistant, has actually worked on that project and, and followed bats using telemetry and so he would be a good person to ask about that. Um, what I've heard is that they move incredible distances at night and they're really hard to follow. Um, so there are definitely lots of bats here but I, I can't say that I'm a, an expert on that. Uh, and then in terms of monkeys, um, the white-faced capuchins are around um, Las Cruces and then this nearby finca that um, the walkable finca that Martha mentioned and then if you go on um, one of the tours that goes up near Las Tablas or La Amistad um, there is a chance that you could see howler monkeys or spider monkeys I've seen both of them in that area of course it's never guaranteed but they are um, they are there awesome great sounds like a lot of cool wildlife opportunities. Uh, Costa Rica is one of those really special places in the world that it has a lot of diversity in wildlife. So while people want to come out to help with the research, I'm sure getting to take some cool new species off of their list is another fun bonus of being on many Earthwatch expeditions, particularly in Costa Rica. Um, there was one question on sort of a practical side about some of the tours and additional activities that can happen if people need to plan to bring cash for that or if you can play with credit cards. Any tips for people on that sort of thing? Because you mentioned some outside of research activities earlier in the presentation. Right. Um, so I know the half day ones, um, I, I didn't go, that was cash, those ones, the coffee farm and the, um, the nature preserve. And as for the other um, group, I asked questions about prices, but um, I did not ask about how to pay. And so that's something we could definitely follow up um, and get that information. Um, but it might also be on their website um, as well. And one of the things, though, um, one of the things um, that I um, found with that. Um, so how they would go is, he said for those trips, he would need like two days in advance. So it's something that you could think about but decide when there. And prices would vary depending on how many people went. So it's hard to give set prices. Um, there's the, the price of the tour itself, but then transportation was you know per car. So if two people went, it'd be more expensive than if four people went. Um, but even then, all the prices for vehicles transportation was about $50 for the vehicle or 75. Um, 
So there's the website though to find out more. Um, and you know, we'd be happy to um, follow up with him as well. Awesome. Thanks so much for going back to the slide for all those. Just, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry did you I wanna... wanted, to, I wanted to add quickly that there are also ATMs here to get cash. So if, if people don't want to travel with it, that's an option. Excellent. Always good to know where your nearest ATM is. Thank you. <laughs> um, so with that, I'm going to wrap things up. Um, so thank you so much, all of you wonderful ladies, um, for sharing your expedition with everyone. Um, only had one team so far, but clearly a lot of great work going on already. Um, I want to thank everyone in the audience for all your thoughtful questions and for sticking with us and, and tuning in. If you're as excited about this project as I am right now, you can sign up and come. Um, we've got some space left on teams in, July, uh, in June and on some teams in 2019. Uh, so you can check out your calendars and get planning. We'd love to have you out. Uh, another sort of wrap up would be if you were here and you're like, oh my gosh, my friend would have totally loved to see this. Um, just like all the past webinars, this one's being recorded and it's gonna be up on YouTube shortly in the next couple days. Um, so you'll be able to find it there and share it with anyone who couldn't join us live. Um, and with that, I'd say stay tuned to your email inboxes to find out about the next webinar that we're gonna have with another um, wonderful Earthwatch scientist like everyone we've had here. So have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.